Praise the Lord. In this video, I want to communicate a simple message. Oftentimes, governments, organs of state, upper echelons of society, like the higher classes with the money, will use language that's not commonly used to appear as though they have a higher level of intelligence, to appear as though they know better than you, and so they should be the ones you trust because of their adeptness in what they're talking about, subject matter. Well, there's an example of what they're talking about, the subject matter. So there's nothing wrong with language. Language is just a form of communication, but oftentimes there are different degrees of the utilization of language um, in order to create a sort of a divide. So one can appear as though they're better qualified to do the job they're doing than the average person. Which may be the case, however, they're not doing it. And therefore they use this um, language to c continue the facade that they're doing this to the best of their ability, which is an ability above yours, so you should submit to them and their attempts and efforts and accept them as the best that can be done and not question it because clearly we have more language than you you see the point so there are a couple of words subterfuge subterfuge means a trick that's it but there's more context subterfuge is a tricky tactic okay what's what what else does that mean subterfuge is a tricky tactic used to achieve one's goals which in most cases is the misleading of a society or the usurpation of power it means to take power over the people or over the government and use them in a way that they weren't in intended to be used so criminally and rely upon the divide between the average person and the government to hold people back from requesting what is their right from the government and what is a reasonable expectation for a citizen to have of the government and to keep the citizens' minds off of what the government should be doing according to the constitution or the, the written law that's given to the government by the people in order to ensure that the countries run properly for the common good, for the good of everybody's household. Now, Freemasons are the witchcraft coven, like a, a wizard's lodge, you know, a group of wizards that meet together and serve the devil. They do so aided and assisted by demons, which are lesser spirits, which are base and they have base urges and sort of less than animalistic behaviors, the real beast, beastly behaviors. And they're trying to implement this through humanity, basically to kill humanity. And their main function and central drive is to kill everything in sight. But they're not uh, discriminatory against any tactic so to achieve that goal. So they won't, they don't care what it takes they'll do it. If it means pretending to be your friend for 50 years, they'll do it, so long as it results in you burning in hell. Because its function, when I say it, I mean the collective demonic spiritual network, is driven by a core urge to kill. And that is the manifest of death. It is death taking on form, trying to conquer life. And so its drive is comparable to another example we have of death which is a lesser degree of death it's death the body but it's still same the same in function and that is to corrupt decay and divide because once the body starts to decompose even the physical flesh of a dead person a cadaver it the corpse starts to decompose which means unbuild itself deconstruct itself which is a what it's a form of division 
So division is a function of death. We know that. We have examples of that, even in the physical manifest. Well, the same is true in the spiritual reality that instructs the physical one. Now, spirit is greater than the flesh, so there are spirits, dead people, who are from the darkness, known as demons, and they are basically trying to kill everyone. And the devil is a fallen angel who has become even worse than a demon in his drives and urges. He's like the head honcho in the movement of death because he first occupied that land. He put his flag there first. So he's sort of the authority over it. Even though he's not the greatest power there, he's the authority over it, which means he instructs where the powers go. And they're part of his body, which is sort of wrapping itself around all of them. So they all operate in the inside of the belly of the beast, which is Satan's belly, a spiritual space that they dwell in and occupy, and he's the authority over it. And he's a cruel authority. And he claims to lead to rule by respect, but really all he's doing is conforming to the word of God, which creates the illusion that he has respect for his people. It's the light of God that instructs that. The Bible says that a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. So in order for Satan to continue hunting, he has to submit to certain mechanisms which are required to have an organized killing effort. So in order to have a collective doing his will, which is to kill, steal and destroy, divide, decompose and corrupt, like a dead body, um, he has to have a sort of a structure, even the bacteria and the enzymes which decompose a body after after it dies, after the physical body dies, they, ha they have a system within them that they have to collectively conform to in order to decompose the body. So there has to be some kind of structure in order to affect death. Now how spiritually is death inflicted upon the people? It is inflicted upon the people through societal structures. Those societal structures simply are the governments, the powers that the people put in place. You see, the authority actually lies with the people, and the governments know that. So they try to create psychological barriers to access so that the people won't question them when they're failing to do their role and duty, which has been given to them by the people. People have said, we're charging you and exacting this task for you so that you can submit to the authority that we have over you and we will give you temporarily the ability to wield that, that authority to good effect and as we have instructed you so to do by our constitution, which is the written law. Now, when the government don't do that, they're committing crimes. Now, there are certain things that the government have to endeavour to do, which means try their best. And so they will pretend to be trying their best while they're destroying those societal s systems. And they'll be coming up with excuses for destroying, which will be, we didn't do it, we didn't intend it, it was out of our control, we did our best given the situation. And that will always be the case. They'll always try to blame something out of their control so that you can't blame them for neglect or failure or corruption or conspiracy to destroy the societal structures which uphold the common good or the welfare of the individual households and therefore the country collectively. And they will ultimately continue to blame something out of their control or just say nothing, like a, like a thug who just r rifled your wallet out of your car and the guards caught him and they're asking him questions and he's just doing that. Whose wallet is that? Did you rob that?
It's basic thuggery 101. Say nothing. They can't force you to talk. Say nothing. Because you run the risk of incriminating yourself. And the guard will even say that you have the right to remain silent if you fail to do so. Anything you do say may be used in evidence, as evidence against you in a court of law. In America they say, plead the fifth, plead the fifth, the fifth amendment. You don't have to actually talk so that you don't incriminate yourself either accidentally or, um, you know, like, when I say accidentally, I mean somebody might say something and get some detail wrong that appears to incriminate them. So it's best if you say nothing, you know. So, because you could appear to incriminate yourself in doing something even though you didn't do it by saying the wrong thing. So it's best not to say anything so it can't be misinterpreted. So that's what Thuggery 101 will teach you, say nothing. And that's what our governments are doing, basic thuggery. We're basically thugs. And what they're not doing is teaching the people what their rights are so that the people don't even know that they should be giving them those rights and working hard to provide them. And if you're not even having the conversation about what they are, how can you be even attempting to provide them? So there are structures within a democracy, within the government, that say the government are held accountable by an opposition. Problem is, they're not an opposition. So what they end up doing is bickering and slighting each other and, you know, defaming one another's characters and all sorts of things apart from actually holding each other accountable for the task at hand. Now they will appear to, but they won't be actually core tasks. They won't be the core rights or the fundamental rights. Like for, I'll give you an example. In Ireland, the man of the household has a right, a fundamental, a fundamental constitutional right. And that right is gain full employment. Now, our forefathers, our ancestors, in other words, a better word, is, sorry, our ancestors knew and wrote into our constitution that the man of the house should have gainful employment so that he's able to take care of his pregnant wife even. Now our granddads had enough money to pay for their wife when she was pregnant, the house, the car and seven children in many cases on one job. What happened? What happened? They're not even having the conversation about gainful employment. They're making up terms to take your attention off your actual rights. Why don't our government talk about gainful employment? When is the last time the term gainful employment left the lips of somebody in government? When was the last time somebody in government in Ireland actually said those words, gainful employment? Because that's the constitutional right. You won't find anywhere in the constitution minimum wage or living wage. They're the terms our government use. Who told them to use those terms? The constitution didn't. The people didn't. Where are they getting these terms? They're making them up. Why are they making them up? Because if they're talking about those terms which aren't enshrined in the Constitution, they're not talking about the ones that are. And if they're not talking about the rights that are actually enshrined in the Constitution, why would you have any expectation that they would be endeavouring to ensure and uphold those rights? Because you don't even know about them. They're not in the conversation. They're not in the rhetoric. They're not in the language. They're not in the discussion. How would you know or why would you hold your government accountable for upholding those rights when they're omitting them from the discussion? They can hardly be endeavouring to ensure them or uphold them if they're not even talking about them and have superimposed their own imaginary and makey up terms over them. If you want to say the term minimum wage as being the least acceptable amount of money paid to an individual at work, it is gainful employment. 
gainful employment is the least acceptable amount of money to pay somebody in Ireland according to the law. Are you getting the picture now? Any amount of money less than gainful employment is a failure on the part of the employer and the government and the collective at large in terms of um, governing powers and regulatory bodies and ministers of finance and etc. An absolute failure on their part to uphold the Constitution of Ireland. And we can see they're not even trying to because they're not even having the conversation about our actual rights which are enshrined in the Constitution of Ireland. So they're hardly trying to uphold the common good if they're not even talking about the mechanisms which do so. They're not interested in the Constitution of Ireland if they're not talking about it, but are having a conversation about something else that some bureaucratic committee coined the phrase of. Minimum wage and living wage. These tea-drinking bureaucratic committees are destroying the Western societies by implementing policies which nobody agreed upon within the states where they're trying to exact them and impose them. So you've got tyranny, absolute dictatorial tyranny, which they're not even discussing, but just implementing so that we don't, we don't excite any resistance. Say nothing. Because if you, if you talk about something, you might excite resistance. Like, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. Say you have 100,000 euros of inheritance in a drawer down in the bank that somebody left you in their will, but nobody's talking about it. Nobody even told you you had this amount of money to collect from the drawer down the bank. Nobody. So you don't even know that you have €100,000 worth of inheritance. So why would you ever go looking for it if nobody told you you had it? So this is why governments don't talk about what your actual rights are, which shows and exposes that they're infiltrators and imposters and usurpers occupying the organs of state, not trying to uphold the societal con uh, cons expectations of them or the constitutions of those lands but they're rather trying to impose a centralized power which is the mechanism of division that's why they're not trying to give the man gainful employment why because they want the woman at work why so they can target the baby in the crash how are they going to do that Look to what's happening in the creches now. They're tightening the grip and constricting those who have private creches. Why? Well, if it's a private creche, you can't tell them what they have to teach. But if it's a government-funded creche, now you have regulatory bodies implementing syllabus. So who's writing the syllabus? You see, when you have private individuals in, in the society running businesses, you have opportunity for diversity. They're, now they're talking about diversification and removing it. They're talking about tolerance as they're intolerant. They're talking about tolerance as they're discriminating. They're talking about collectiveness as they're dividing. They talk about one thing and do another. And they try and sit in every position as though they're on everybody's side while they're implementing those mechanisms of division. Now, currently the crashes are under a lot of pressure. There's like a national, uh, what you call it? There's a national drive on now. What do they call a protest, a drive, a sort of a meeting, a gathering to exclaim and communicate that there's a lot of creches just a hair away from closing their doors because of the lack of funding and support. Now why 
You see, the problem, the problem is when, when you call on your government for funding and support, now the government have a say on the protocols that have to be met in order to get that granting and that funding. Ha ha ha! Oh, you can have the grant, but it's just a matter of your soul. You can have the grant. It's just a matter that you have to teach our syllabus if you want our grant. So what they're trying to do is centralize things. So they impose poverty. They impose poverty. It's very serious. I can't stress to you enough how serious it is. It's crime against humanity. It's occupancy, it's militarized and mobilized attack on the society. When they try to suck the life out of the individual who set something up, they try and suck them dry economically so that they can appear to grant, but the grant comes with certain stipulations. And those stipulations are often the removal of good leaven and the implementation of divisive mechanism. Because death wants to implement division through centralized powers, because it's the only means of doing so. So talk about diversity, talk about variety, talk about tolerance, talk about togetherness, and implement division, decay, and corruption. Implement satanic rhetoric implement anti-Christian mechanisms to remove from the collective world body the good leaven of Christian belief and the implementation of Western societal structures as we know them and have known them for thousands of years. So what they're trying to do is suck the good leaven out of the community, out of their society and implement these syllabi, these teaching uh, languages and doctrines which will ultimately teach the children to embrace Satan. To me this is absolutely abhorrent. It's detestable, it's disgusting that they use a facade that there's poverty by tying the purse strings in order to implement submission. They're trying to submit people through the removal of funding. It is puke. It is disgusting crud. They're pretending that there's poverty to take from you. They orchestrate these collapses. They orchestrate these crises. They orchestrate them. They're facades of the devil. And how they do them is do nothing. It's Thug 101. Do nothing, say nothing. Don't talk about what it is their actual rights are, then they won't have any expectation of them. Don't implement what it is are their societal structures and say nothing as you don't do it. It's neglect. So they neglect to say and they neglect to do and they allow these problems to form. They allow them to form by neglecting to carry out the office properly. And then once the neglect has had its negative impact, then they come along as the solution. But the solution comes with certain stipulations. And those stipulations is, are the exacting of their agenda. One world government, one world religion. Submit them, to, submit them to Satan in principle, and we'll eventually submit them to Satan in worship. And that's what they're doing. They're crowning their king. And I'm warning you ahead of time, don't be trapped in it. Don't be swallowed in that belly. In Jesus' name, let the Lord come as he will and restrain the devil. Because the devil can't hold him back. So these things eventually have to happen because evil will remove itself. Don't be removed with it. Put your faith in Jesus and continue to do good works. Be a shining example. Be the light of the world. Don't look to yourself. Look to Christ. Deny yourself and continue to do what Jesus would do in that situation. Blessings in Jesus' name. Don't believe them. They're liars. 
gainful employment enables the woman to stay at home in the house and raise a family and build a household and help run the world. And the failure to give the man gainful employment, which is his constitutional right, and failure to even talk about it, exposes the government as not caring, but deliberately superimposing terms which aren't enshrined in the Constitution to take the attention off what is enshrined in the Constitution and their duty to uphold it. Blessings in Jesus' name. Holy kiss.